Morris parked in front of the shopping centre, staring out the window into the early August evening. The day was nearing sunset, but the cool, fresh twilight was still far off due to the late summer darkness. Morris had a crazy day at work, from summarising the month's activities to developing a new project. However, he enjoyed the multitasking. The constant problem-solving kept him engaged, like a captivating game. But most importantly, it kept his mind off melancholic thoughts and prevented him from dwelling on the past. Morris was in no hurry to get out of the car, enjoying the cool cabin while the street outside sweltered in an abnormal heat wave. People were yearning for the fall and the chance to breathe freely. Morris looked out the window again. Two people came into his field of vision, a middle-aged man and a lanky teenager. The teen, tall and slightly awkward, gestured enthusiastically, occasionally breaking into a smile. When Morris saw boys of a certain age, he always thought that he could have a son just like him now. He would have turned fourteen this summer. Perhaps his son would be into programming or sports, or maybe he'd like to draw. However, these thoughts were simply speculation, as this boy was never born. Perhaps it could have even been a girl. Over the years, Morris had regretted his behaviour, but time could not be reversed. All he could do was live with guilt, long for a different future, miss Kelly, and search fruitlessly for her traits in other women. Morris had been a different person back then, young and somewhat selfish. Now, he didn't want to remember his past self before meeting Kelly. Morris realised that thoughts and memories were taking over him again. This happened from time to time, with past situations, voices and images refusing to leave him. He assumed they never would. After all, he felt he deserved such a life. Morris was raised in a prosperous family for his city's standards. His father was a successful businessman, and his mother was the chief accountant of a large factory. He grew up in a large, beautiful house, surrounded by expensive toys, fashionable clothes, and frequent travels. He never had to deny himself anything. Morris attended a prestigious school where he had many friends, both boys and girls. They were all from wealthy families and often visited cafes, amusement rides, entertainment centres, and later, expensive clubs and bar parties. Morris's life was filled with fun and carefree moments. Despite his father's persuasion to attend the best university in the country for its superior prospects, Morris chose to enrol in a local college. He understood that, at university, he'd have to study intensely to earn a diploma, unlike at his local college, where he had more freedom. He knew from older friends whom to pay to avoid wasting his youth on lectures and seminars, and he had no plans to change this. Everything went according to his plans. Morris became an economic student at the local college, marking the start of the golden era of his life. Morris moved away from his parents after receiving an apartment in the city centre from his paternal grandparents and an expensive car from his maternal grandparents as graduation from school gifts. Feeling happy, powerful and independent, Morris looked forward to a life filled with friends, entertainment and beautiful girls. His busy schedule left no room for studying. He rarely attended college, only showing up before exams to discuss issues with his professors, a common practice of rich kids at his college. Now, being mature, Morris regretted his attitude towards women during his student years. He viewed them as objects of beauty, created specifically for him and others like him. He disregarded their feelings and desires, choosing his companions based on their appearance, much like selecting items in a store. In his younger years, he preferred women with model-like features, big-eyed, relaxed and always smiling. He didn't pay attention to the others. As a handsome, wealthy man, he had no shortage of female attention. Women would approach him in clubs or cafes, and even waited outside his college to catch his attention. Given this, Morris felt like a prized catch, 
and believed he could have every girl. It was a game of hunter and prey to him. Some girls would play hard to get, but Morris saw it as the start of the game. He would turn on his charm to win them over, enjoying the process of wooing them with grand gestures, huge bouquets of roses, cute plush toys, exquisite jewellery, and even daring displays of affection. He thrived on inventing new ways to surprise and delight them, often melting the coldest hearts. However, once the thrill of the chase ended, Morris's interest used to wane quickly. The once mysterious and attractive girl seemed boring and uninteresting to him, and left her. Ending a relationship was always a tricky task for Morris. He disliked women's tears and found long conversation and pleas burdensome. They depressed him and made him feel like a villain. Therefore, Morris preferred the tactic of accusation. He always found something to blame on his soon-to-be ex. Everyone had weaknesses, and while his approach was arguably cruel, he saw no other way. It might be possible that, after such assaults by Morris, the girls developed complexes, even psychological traumas, but otherwise they wouldn't leave him in peace. Various situations coloured Morris's life, but one stood out. He met Stephanie in a nightclub. She was just his type, attractive, outgoing and carefree. Her confident dancing on the dance floor made it impossible to ignore her. A bit tipsy, her long hair swirled beautifully as she danced, relishing the attention. Morris had recently ended a nearly three-month relationship and was eager for new adventures. He quickly decided that he would leave the club that evening only with her, a beautiful young woman in a daring miniskirt and red high heels. Stephanie's appearance was vulgar, but Morris was immediately drawn to her vivacity. He watched Stephanie for about an hour, and when their eyes locked finally, he smiled at her. Without uttering a word, she suddenly started approaching him. Captivated, he watched her graceful movements, anticipating what would happen next. She boldly took the initiative, an intriguing and unusual move. Coming up to him and looking straight into his eyes, she kissed him. Caught in disbelief, Morris embraced her and pulled her closer. She offered no resistance. Then they danced together. Enamoured by this enigmatic woman, Morris was drawn to the fiery spirit in her eyes, a spark of wild excitement. He had never known anyone like her before. She was uniquely different. Eventually, they introduced themselves. Stephanie led Morris by the hand to the balcony, which was quiet and deserted. You! I've never met someone like you before, confessed Morris with admiration. No wonder. There's just no one like me any more, Stephanie replied with a smile. Stephanie had rented a tiny apartment in the city. She had moved here from a village and even managed to enrol in law school. However, her spirit was not inclined towards academia, despite her evident abilities. She preferred entertainment, socialising, dancing until dawn in nightclubs, and embarking on adventures. This lifestyle didn't align well with the role of a diligent student. In her first year, Stephanie, a beautiful student, fell for a young charismatic history teacher. She was so enamoured that she couldn't think of anything but his grey eyes. Their relationship became public, leading to the teacher's resignation and Stephanie's expulsion. After her expulsion, the girl could no longer live in the dormitory, which was only for students, and didn't want to return to her boring village. So she found work as a waitress in a bar. Hired for her looks to cheer up customers, she earned enough to afford an apartment and inexpensive yet stylish clothes from mass market. In general, Stephanie was content with her life. She enjoyed her work at a bustling bar, where the atmosphere was always pleasant. Every night there were many visitors and local musicians, mostly rock bands and rock soloists performed on the stage. At this bar she met Paul, her first true love. As the lead singer of the most successful band there, he introduced her to a whole new world. They travelled together through many cities while his band toured, performing at various venues. However, as often happens, 
Paul found a new muse. Stephanie mourned their breakup for a long time, before realizing it wasn't worth wasting her youth on regret, especially when she had other admirers. Deciding not to fall in love again, Stephanie chose to live at the moment, enjoying her youth, freedom and social interactions. She sought pleasure and didn't worry about the future. Morris was drawn to her carefree spirit, something he felt he lacked. Stephanie was a thrill-seeker. She could drink a bottle of champagne and then recklessly speed past a traffic policeman. Unafraid, she would comfortably sit on the edge of high-rise buildings, her legs dangling below. She got along well with others and even shoplifted, not out of necessity, but for the adrenaline rush. Stephanie was full of surprises. Morris was captivated by her unpredictability. He never knew what she would do next. In addition to her daring feats, Stephanie was also artistically gifted. She wrote poetry, played the guitar masterfully, made clever jokes, and sang beautifully. Her charisma was magnetic. She was the life and soul of any gathering, never failing to entertain. A few years ago, Stephanie stopped communicating with her parents because they consistently tried to mould her into something she wasn't. They always wanted a son, she sighed sadly, and that's probably why they disliked everything about me. Her laughter was too loud and gleeful for their liking. She talked too fast and too much. Her friends weren't good enough for their standards, her academic performance was lacking, and they perceived her as defiant. Her father chose her major for her, law. Stephanie agreed, as arguing with him seemed impossible. However, once she escaped their control and moved to the city, she decided to be true to herself, a decision she never regretted. When they found out that I left law school, they wanted to bring me back and correct my lifestyle, but I resisted. My father said that if I went against his wishes, I was no longer their daughter and couldn't rely on their help. Live as you know. That's what he told me, and that was what exactly I wanted. So, I live as I wish and have no regrets, she declared. Morris was fascinated by Stephanie's stories. Despite being a year younger, she had experienced and seen so much in her life. However, one time, Stephanie's endless parties began to wear on Morris. He occasionally wanted to spend quiet evenings at home, but Stephanie would persistently drag him out. Whether it was to a bar, a spontaneous night swim from the city embankment, or a stroll around the city, Stephanie was always on the go. The adventurous spirit Morris once found attractive had become an exhausting trait. The unpredictability that once excited him now only irritated him. Morris knew that Stephanie loved him, and he understood parting wouldn't be easy. But what followed was something he could never have imagined. Stephanie had been living in his apartment for almost a year, and the image of her packing her bags and leaving was difficult to imagine. He had never invited a girl to live with him before, and had never been with someone for that long. So he was unsure how to handle the situation this time. Stephanie sensed tension between them, she used to ask, What's wrong with you? Is something wrong with me? What is happening between us? Morris always remained silent, sighing deeply, and leaving her guessing about their relationship's direction. The tension culminated on a December evening, when Morris had a conflict with his uncooperative thesis supervisor. The professor refused to take bribes, and demanded substantial work on the thesis which Morris wouldn't complete by the deadline. Compounding his stress was Stephanie, with her constant carefree smile and poorly timed suggestions. What are you worried about? It's just a thesis, she'd say, shrugging her delicate shoulders. People live without a degree. And at this point, Morris finally lost his patience. Months of pent-up frustration erupted as he lashed out at Stephanie, accusing her of selfishness and lack of foresight. The pain and shock in Stephanie's eyes as she listened were profound. I'm sorry, I'll be what you want me to be, she said quietly, 
when Morris finished his angry tirade. He was taken aback. Stephanie had fought for so long to be herself and behave the way she wanted, but now she was willing to change herself to please him. However, it was too late. Stephanie, I'm sorry I yelled at you, Morris said, composing himself. But we must part. I've wanted to tell you for a long time, but I didn't dare. Now it just came out. No, Stephanie exclaimed. Despair echoed in her voice. She wasn't ready to accept it. In a burst of emotion, she swept the vase off the table. It shattered into a thousand pieces on the tiled floor. You can't do this. You can't push me away. Stephanie, we're adults. I love you more than anyone in the world. Don't you understand? Morris looked at Stephanie, who was hysterical, and realized more and more clearly that she was really crazy. What once seemed attractive and mysterious now seemed repulsive, frightening, and pathetic. Go away. Morris declared, sliding back towards the door. He attempted to evade Stephanie's embrace, but she clung to him like a lifeline. Eventually, he managed to push her out the door. He was not overly concerned about where she would go. Stephanie had many friends in the city and several admirers who would be happy to take her in. She wouldn't be left adrift. That same evening, Morris packed Stephanie's belongings. Into two large bags, it was harsh, but he felt no obligation to tolerate her abnormal behaviour. One of Stephanie's friends came to collect her things later. How is she? Morris asked, more out of politeness than genuine concern. She's been crying non-stop, doesn't want anything. The friend replied sadly. Morris nodded, hoping that Stephanie would soon find comfort and perhaps a new love. She had experienced this cycle numerous times before. It was typical for her. However, Stephanie did not find comfort. Instead, she began to pursue Morris with her usual intensity. One day, she showed up at his college, dressed in a way that was reminiscent of a nun. Her sorrowful eyes, a floor-length skirt, and beautiful hair covered with a scarf were a stark contrast to her usual appearance. I'm changing for you," she said quietly to Morris. "You see, I'm trying very hard. I'm different now, submissive, obedient. I'll do anything you tell me. Even more unnerving, declarations of love and pleas for forgiveness began to appear on the walls of the entrance to Morris's apartment. Stephanie also bombarded him with emails and letters. Some. Even written in verse. No matter where Morris went, whether it was a shopping centre, a cafe bar, or a park, Stephanie was there. She pursued him, begged for his attention, even threatened him. Morris didn't know how to escape her. Reasoning with her didn't help. Stephanie didn't listen. One day, Stephanie attacked him. Morris had just defended his thesis and was returning home from the celebration of this long-awaited event. It was very late; the street was deserted. Morris got out of the cab, paid the driver, and, in a good mood, headed for his building. Indistinguishable against the pre-dawn landscape, Stephanie, dressed entirely in black, came at him like a fury. If you don't want to be with me. Then no one will have you. Stephanie attacked Morris. He was so surprised that he didn't resist immediately. Stephanie displayed an almost inhuman strength at that moment. However, she overlooked one thing: he was physically stronger. Morris managed to push her away. Stephanie fell hard onto the asphalt, landing on her back. "What are you doing?" exclaimed Morris. You're out of control. Calm down.、Uh, I'm sorry, Stephanie stammered, tears streaming down her face. I don't know what came over me. I love you. Morris retreated into the building, slamming the door behind him. He was uneasy. 
Today, Stephanie had gone too far. What if next time she attacked him with a knife? Being afraid of a girl was a new experience for him. Morris was in a difficult situation. The next day, Stephanie's friend, who had collected her belongings, called him. She told him, in a shaky voice, that Stephanie had attempted suicide, but her attempt had failed. The ambulance arrived quickly, and now Stephanie was in intensive care. Morris didn't know what to do. He felt guilty about what had happened to Stephanie. However, he was still afraid of her. It was a terrible, unsettling feeling. Fortunately, Stephanie survived, but she was diagnosed with a stress-induced disease. Morris chose not to dwell on the cause of her stress. She was admitted to a psychiatric clinic, and their mutual friends informed Morris that her parents visited her regularly, finally acknowledging their responsibility for their daughter. Morris never saw Stephanie again, but this difficult chapter of his life led him to realize his mistreatment of women, treating them as mere objects. From then on, Morris became more considerate. He paid closer attention to women, noticed their feelings, and strived to be more sensitive and attentive, always maintaining a safe distance. He engaged in light, hassle-free relationships with clear boundaries, devoid of romance. There were also no surprises, as he had had his fill with Stephanie. Thanks to his father, Morris secured a good position at a local oil plant. The job offered a decent salary and impressive career prospects, so he fully immersed himself in the work. Although he was an average student, he thrived as an employee, learning the intricacies of his job, self-educating and observing his more experienced colleagues. This lifestyle continued for several years. Morris excelled in his profession and earned a good reputation in his company. He was respected and quickly advanced in his career, a testament to his skills rather than his father's influence. Morris's parents were incredibly proud of their matured son. They hadn't expected much from him in his youth. He lived like a typical rich kid, neglecting his studies, living recklessly, and spending money without a thought. But then Morris surprisingly matured and started to think critically, his transformation made his parents incredibly happy and proud of him. The only thing missing for their complete happiness was for Morris to start a family and provide them with grandchildren. However, they didn't press the matter. Then, Kelly entered Morris's life. She had come to their office for a work-related matter. She was an economist from a partner organization and had to deal with some accounting issues. Morris bumped into her at the entrance, as he was rushing to the parking lot. Kelly wasn't the type of girl Morris usually gravitated towards. She was pretty, but not in a model-like way. She was short, very thin, with a short haircut. Her attentive grey eyes, freckled, slightly upturned nose, and thin lips reminded him of an elf from a fairy tale. Morris, for reasons he couldn't comprehend, halted, gazing at the visitor. She glanced at him absent-mindedly before hurrying on, clutching a folder of documents tightly in her hands. Morris, despite his hurry, instinctively followed her. His pursuit wasn't in vain. On the third floor, the elf girl stopped and began to look around in confusion. She was clearly lost in their labyrinth-like office that often confounded newcomers. "'Lost something?' he asked with a smile, seizing the opportunity to engage her under a believable pretext. "'Yes,' the beautiful stranger returned his smile. "'I need to find the accounting office, but I seem to be lost. "'I'll be happy to show you the way.' Morris purposefully took the longest route. Along the way they chatted and got to know each other. Kelly was easy to talk to and casual, as if they had known each other for years. This impressed Morris. He didn't want to part with her when the door to the accounting office came into view. "'Well, here we are,' Morris said with slight disappointment in his voice. "'To be honest, I don't want to let you go in there.' "'Why? Are the female employees there so mean?' Kelly joked. "'It's not that. I just have to leave right now, and when I return you'll be gone. I 
don't want us to part and never see each other again. I understand, Kelly nodded, then added, I feel the same way. Morris felt a warm wave sweep over him after hearing these words. His soul felt light, and the world around him seemed brighter. She liked him too. This was real happiness. He suddenly wanted to scoop her up and whirl her down the corridor, but he restrained himself, as it was perhaps too soon for such displays of affection. Mm, that's nice to hear, Morris replied, his eyes shining undoubtedly conveying his joy at her words. He asked for Kelly's cell phone and quickly dialed his number before making a call. There, now we're connected. And I'll definitely call you. He smiled at Kelly. I'll be waiting, she replied seriously. And he did call. Of course, he called the same day, as soon as he returned from the department and reported to his superior. Several hours remained until the end of the workday, but Kelly was finishing later than Morris. They agreed that Morris would pick her up from work in the evening. Later that day, they spent some time in a cafe getting to know each other and sharing personal details. Kelly lived with her mother in a small apartment in a newly built area and had graduated from the economics department of a local college. Morris also attended this college, and he mused that if he had attended classes more often, he might have met Kelly earlier. However, he doubted she would have caught his interest back then, as his attention was solely on girls with model looks. Kelly was gentle and sensitive to people's moods. She was calm, serious, hard-working, and remarkably responsible. A bit timid, yet capable of doing much to achieve her goals. Morris and Kelly complemented each other like two halves of a whole. Despite their differences, they were irresistibly drawn to each other. They cherished their moments together, strolling late into the night hand in hand, and savouring each other's embrace in the car. Morris was happy with her, and was grateful for their fortuitous meeting in the office. However, he didn't know how to suggest that Kelly come to live with him. After Stephanie, he had never invited anyone to his place. It seemed more logical to offer to Kelly to move in, given they had been dating for almost a year and were both of an appropriate age for marriage. Yet Morris hesitated, feeling the gravity of such a significant step. There were several reasons for this. From an early age, his parents had warned him against hasty marriages. You're a handsome, wealthy young man, his mother would advise. You'll attract women who dream of a marriage of convenience. They first marry a rich man, then divorce him, and legally demand his money and property. There are countless stories like this. Be cautious. Morris never suspected Kelly of greed. However, he firmly believed that marriage was a significant and thoughtful decision not to be rushed. They were both young and could afford to enjoy themselves, have fun and travel. The formalities of marriage could wait. Moreover, marriage often leads to children and Morris wasn't ready for that burden. He observed his married friends, noticing how the arrival of children often strained their relationships. The young parents were exhausted devoting all their time to the children while bickering over household chores and responsibilities. They seemed to live solely for their children, with their conversations revolving around kids, their activities, talents, and choices like which strollers to buy. This saddened Morris. He wasn't ready for fatherhood. He wanted to enjoy his youth, not spend his time consumed by childcare. So, while Morris was thinking about how to propose to Kelly that she move in with him, leaving aside the question of marriage, she herself started talking about living together. It turned out that she herself had long thought about moving in with him, and about a wedding, by the way, also had not yet thought. I know I might not be supposed to say this, but I would love to fall asleep and wake up in your arms every day and it would make my commute to work easier, she confessed. Morris beamed. He had effortlessly solved a problem that had been troubling him for a while. Now, 
Morris and Kelly only separated during work hours. They lived together like a family. Initially, there was an adjustment period. Kelly wasn't very self-sufficient when it came to household duties, but it was understandable since she had lived with her mother. Morris taught her a lot, how to cook and clean efficiently. It was enjoyable and heartwarming. Such tasks seemed to bring Kelly and Morris even closer. Kelly proved to be a fast learner who quickly excelled beyond her mentor. She developed a passion for cooking complex, unconventional meals. Maybe it's time to consider a career change, Morris jokingly suggested as he sampled another one of Kelly's culinary masterpieces. You can't keep such talents hidden. Maybe I'll change it, Kelly responded, almost seriously. But not now. When I have spare time, I'll open my own restaurant. That would be fantastic. Over time, Kelly's and Morris's friends got to know each other and formed a close-knit group. They enjoyed going on outings together, whether it was to the mountains, the sea, or on tour trips. Sometimes they would gather at someone's house and play board games, an activity that Morris found surprisingly fun. Kelly's friend Cassie always seemed to look at Morris uniquely, which puzzled him. Does Cassie have something against me? Morris asked Kelly one day. No, not at all, Kelly replied with a smile. You just look a lot like a guy Cassie used to be in love with. It's a bit of a sad story. Cassie was practically begging for his attention, but he just laughed it off and dated other girls. He didn't have to reciprocate her feelings, of course, but he was unnecessarily cruel to her. Despite this, Cassie continued to love him. What a drama, Morris remarked. We were too young then, Kelly explained. You can forgive a lot at that age. I never met him, but Cassie mentioned how much you resemble him. And how did that story end? Morris asked. It was nothing. The guy went to the capital, seeking happiness with another passion. Cassie was heartbroken, searching for him on social media, until she started noticing other guys. And it seemed like that chapter was behind her. But now, with you here, she's having flashbacks of her first unhappy love. So, do I resemble him that much? Very much, according to her, but the resemblance is only on the surface. You are kind, sensitive and deep, while he is selfish, shallow and empty. It's surprising that Cassie didn't notice it right away. She wasn't a naive girl. Morris sighed. Kelly didn't know him when he was younger, and he was no better than Cassie's sweetheart. Stephanie came to mind again. Where is she now? How is she? Morris shook his head, dismissing the unpleasant thoughts. Morris and Kelly lived harmoniously, sharing experiences, adventures, and moments with friends and shopping together. They supported and cared for each other as a married couple. This dynamic continued for several years. Kelly started thinking about children, eager to become a mother. Morris understood her desire, but he wasn't ready for parenthood. I still have a lot to do before having a child, reasoned Morris. I want to advance my career, travel to wild Africa, learn to fly a plane, and start my own business. With children, these dreams and plans would be difficult to realize. That's a pity, Kelly sighed. I've dreamed of us having children for a long time, but if you're not ready, I'll wait. I want our child to bring joy to both of us. I wouldn't settle for anything less. Morris was relieved that Kelly understood and accepted his decision. However, life had other plans. One day, Kelly shared news that completely disrupted his content and carefree life. Morris, we need to talk seriously. Is something wrong? A sense of unease crept over Morris. Kelly appeared unusually flustered and pale. Could she be seriously ill? Something's happened. I don't know how to tell you. A sudden fear gripped Morris. Was she planning to leave him? He couldn't bear the thought of losing Kelly. What if she had found someone else? I find it difficult to tell you this, knowing how you feel. However, I'm pregnant. Morris felt as if he'd been hit over the head with a sandbag. 
he could feel waves of panic washing over him. I don't know how this happened. I mean, we used protection, but it happens. I've already been to the doctor. He said no method is a hundred percent guaranteed. So, Kelly, you know I don't want to become a father now. Morris said gently, looking into her eyes. I'm developing my career. I have a long business trip coming up, and I have so many unrealized plans. It's not the time for a child. I understand. Kelly lowered her eyes. But this baby, he's already here, you know. They even let me listen to its heartbeat. It's such a miracle. I know how much you want this, but I can't. You don't have to be afraid. Kelly took his hands and looked into his eyes. It's going to be okay. Just think, we have everything we need to make this baby happy: an apartment, a job, money, everything. People give birth in far more challenging conditions and still manage. We'll be happy too. There's no need to be afraid. We're together. Morris shook his head. The image of a friend who had recently become a father suddenly appeared before his eyes, with ruffled hair, a semolina-stained T-shirt, sleep-deprived red eyes, and a blank smile. It was clear to Morris that he didn't want to become like that. So he began to insist on the termination. The word was difficult to utter, especially when looking into Kelly's eyes. But it was a matter of freedom and safety. He didn't reject the idea of having a child entirely, just not now. Do you even understand what you're suggesting? Kelly's voice was cold, reflecting her struggle. I understand, but advancements in medicine mean the process could be quick and painless. Given your early stage, there won't be any consequences, Morris said. Fully aware of the gravity of his words, he just couldn't, and he also had a say in the matter, because the baby, he will entirely change and turn his world upside down. Kelly must reckon with him. Her gaze was filled with pain, disappointment, and disbelief, as though he was a stranger. You're scaring me, Kelly said quietly. You scare me a lot. And you need to understand how scared I am," Morris responded. Morris suddenly recalled his mother's old warning about cunning girls who trap wealthy men into marriage. "You just want to marry me," Morris declared. "You're just like the rest of them. I thought you were different." Without uttering another word, Kelly turned and left the apartment, taking only her car keys. Morris. Immediately regretted his words. He knew Kelly wasn't like that, and he shouldn't have upset her. However, she needed to understand that they weren't ready for a child. He had told her this numerous times, and she always seemed to agree. Morris rushed to the balcony, intending to call Kelly back. They could discuss everything calmly, and realize there was no rush. He would even apologize for his harsh words. He truly loved Kelly; she was dear to him. But Kelly didn't turn when he called out. She climbed into her car and drove away swiftly. It's okay, Morris muttered to himself. She'll cool down, consider the pros and cons, and come back. She can't be without me. I know she loves me, and I love her. We'll be together again. Morris took a bottle of whiskey from the bar and uncorked it, seeking relaxation. The strong drink made the world simpler and clearer. He sent a conciliatory text message to Kelly, apologizing for his harsh words, expressing his love, and proposing a discussion. Morris was already even ready to discuss the matter of having a child, knowing its importance to Kelly. He was prepared to make that sacrifice, believing he wouldn't find a better partner than her. He couldn't imagine life without her. It's just that the news had thrown him unbalanced, but he was determined to think it through, weigh all factors, and plan. He called her several times that evening, but she didn't answer. He understood that she was upset, possibly crying. 
It was painful to realize he had hurt her. Morris wanted to bring joy to Kelly, to make her smile and be happy. But instead, he had caused her tears. That evening, Morris found himself unable to sleep. Distractedly, flipping through the city news feed on his phone, he stumbled upon a report about a recent highway accident. Photos from the accident scene showed Kelly's car in ruins, filling him with horror. Morris had given the car to Kelly a little over a year ago, shortly after she had received her driving license. Initially, she was embarrassed by such an extravagant gift, but he insisted. She eventually gave in, grew to love the car, which she affectionately named Swallow, and took it to the car wash more frequently than necessary. Morris was clinging to the hope of a mistake. There must be numerous white cars zooming around the city, right? It was not a unique model, but the unique ballerina cat pendant hanging from the shattered windshield was. He had bought it in Finland during a recent business trip. The likelihood of someone else in town having a similar accessory was slim. It must be Kelly's car. Morris frantically searched for information about the accident. It seemed the driver had lost control and crashed into the road barriers at a high speed. But Kelly was always so cautious. Morris had even teased her for being overly slow. The driver was hospitalized in a hospital in a serious condition. Morris read under a horrifying photo. In serious condition, but alive! Morris caught onto that glimmer of hope and immediately called a cab to the hospital. It was late at night. The nurse, a sleepy girl, asked who Morris was. When he said he was Kelly's live-in partner, the nurse, with a hint of regret in her voice, informed him that they couldn't disclose patient information to him unless they were married. If we were married. Morris chuckled bitterly at the thought. He continued to wander the hospital grounds, peering into windows, until a guard shooed him away. However, he didn't give up, returning to the clinic's lobby, determined to find out about Kelly's condition. There, he encountered her mother. They embraced, both confused and frightened. Her mother was in tears, unaware of Kelly's quarrel with him. If she had known, she probably wouldn't have spoken to him. Morris blamed himself for what had happened. "'How is she? They won't tell me anything about her,' he said. "'She's in intensive care after surgery. She's in critical condition. The doctors say there's little hope. She... did you know Kelly was pregnant?' she asked. Morris nodded. "'Well, the baby couldn't be saved. The doctors are fighting for her life.' How happy you would have been if the accident hadn't happened. You'd be expecting a baby. I would have been happy for both of you, she said. Morris simply nodded, tears streaming down his face as he listened to Kelly's mother. Kelly's mother managed to get permission for Morris to visit Kelly in the intensive care unit, albeit briefly. Morris sat next to Kelly who appeared to be just sleeping. He held her hand and spoke to her, apologising and pleading for her to wake up. He promised that once she regained consciousness, they would marry and start planning a family. He painted pictures of a beautiful future together, hoping these prospects would rouse her. It was excruciating to accept that Kelly's condition was his fault, her high-speed drive on the highway was a result of their foolish argument. No one knew about Morris's guilt, yet it didn't soothe his conscience. His only wish was for Kelly to wake up. But sadly, the miracle never happened. She never regained consciousness. One night, Kelly was gone, and the doctors could do nothing. Morris lost the will to live. He neglected his basic needs, stopped working, and ignored his friend's cause. His life lost all colour and meaning. And then there's this guilt. 
it sometimes covered the man so that it became impossible to breathe. Morris even thought about ending his suffering overnight. Why should he live? Nothing good will not be any more, because Kelly couldn't be returned to him. And he did not deserve happiness. It's because of his stupid fear. His beloved is gone now. The parents hired a famous doctor for Morris, but he could not help him. He didn't know the whole truth. Morris could not tell anyone about his guilt. It was too hard, too scary. Morris encountered Cassie, Kelly's friend, entirely by chance, while returning home from the store. These days, Morris's outings only extended as far as the closest liquor store before heading straight home. Drinking, even a little, clouded his mind and provided a distraction. Cassie looked at Morris with empathy and sorrow. She was also dealing with the loss of her best friend, as she and Kelly had been very close. Yet, upon learning about Morris's condition, Cassie sought to support him. An admirable gesture. The man welcomed her company and invited the woman to his home. They sat at the table, reminiscing about Kelly, shedding tears. Suddenly, Morris decided to reveal the truth to Cassie about his dreadful behaviour before the tragic accident. It's all my fault, Morris concluded. He expected Cassie to berate and blame him. It would have been natural and justified, but instead she sympathised with him. You're not to blame. Things just happened that way. Cassie comforted Morris, stroking his head as one would a child, which eased his distress. You were just frightened. So was Kelly. Neither of you intended for this to happen. It was raining that day. The road was slippery. It wasn't your fault. It was just an unfortunate event. Cassie's support was more beneficial to Morris than any expensive psychologist could have been. They began to call each other occasionally, and these conversations had a healing effect on him. Morris regained his senses and returned to work, gradually pulling himself out of the dark abyss where he had been trapped for so long. His parents were happy, and his friends and colleagues noted that Morris was becoming his old self, but they were all mistaken. Morris knew he would never be the same person again. Years had passed since that fateful day. While the sharp pain of the immediate aftermath had faded, a sense of longing and sadness for what could have been remained with Morris. He had come to terms with it. He never met another woman who reminded him of Kelly, and he wouldn't settle for less, especially after experiencing a love so profound that it only happens once in a lifetime, if at all. And now, when Morris was ready to get out of his car for the supermarket, a little boy of about four caught his attention. The child, wearing an oversized shirt, was rummaging through the garbage bins. He had climbed on top of the bins to reach the edge of the container, busily sorting through wasted fruit with his tiny hands. A restaurant in the mall often discarded food in the trash, attracting homeless people from the area. But at this moment, there were no adults in sight, and from the child's assured actions, it wasn't the child's first time doing so. Morris felt uneasy leaving the child unattended. The risks were numerous falling into a trash can, encountering large stray dogs, crossing paths with ill-intentioned people, or darting cars. He considered calling the police, but hesitated for some reason. The child soon retrieved a bag of leftovers from the trash, clumsily descended from the containers, and wandered off, gnawing on a piece of bread. Morris's heart ached at the sight of such a small child, clumsily walking, yet already fending for themselves. This child's unfortunate circumstance was a harsh reality. Morris could not ignore the situation. He quietly left the car and followed the child. The boy shuffled confidently towards the road, with adults bustling past, oblivious to the little figure. Only occasionally did someone glance at the boy with surprise before moving on. Such indifference was astonishing, a small child alone in the street, and no one seemed to care. The boy turned into a narrow alley, 
and Morris followed. After a kilometre, they reached a residential area, unfamiliar to Morris. Despite being near the city centre with its well-maintained squares, impressive fountains and wide sidewalks, this area was marked by poverty, desolation, dust and trash. The boy approached an old rickety gate. Behind it was a garden overrun with weeds, at the end of which stood a house in need of paint with a sagging roof. The little boy pushed open the old door and slipped through. From outside, Morris observed, curious about what would happen next. Were adults inside waiting for the child? Why would they let such a small child venture out alone? The boy sprinted up onto the porch and concealed himself behind the slightly open front door. Morris hesitated for a moment, contemplating his next move. The child was apparently at home and unharmed, so Morris could theoretically leave. After all, he had only walked the child to his home, ensuring he didn't encounter any trouble. However, Morris's unease lingered. What if the child was in distress or danger? With these thoughts, Morris knocked on the gate. A minute later, an elderly man emerged on the porch. He was thin and short, with sweatpants hiked up to his knees and a worn-out T-shirt. His face was unshaven and puffy, an unhealthy red hue, with swollen, clouded eyes. It was apparent that the man liked drinking. "'Are you here to see me?' the old man croaked. "'To see you,' Morris confirmed. "'What's this about?' "'About a kid who just got home.' "'Are you from the guardianship office?' The old man's voice sounded threatening. "'No,' Morris was quick to reassure him. "'Just a passer-by, I wanted to talk to you.' "'Did my Ewan make a mess again?' The old man muttered under his breath. "'Come in, the gate's unlocked.' The yard resembled a dump, filled with piles of trash and broken bricks, beer cans, and bottles of cheap liquor scattered everywhere. Surprisingly, amidst all this chaos, there was a makeshift sandbox. "'What do you want?' the old man asked in a less than polite manner. "'I just thought maybe you needed some help. "'Your kid's out alone on the streets. "'I found him by the garbage cans outside the mall looking for food.' "'What a brat!' the old man grinned. "'I've told you in many times not to go there, but he doesn't listen.' "'The child was looking for food. He was clearly very hungry. "'What's his relation to you? Who is he?' "'He's my grandson.' replied the old man. My only grandson, and you're right, good man. We could really use some help. We need money, since I can't work because of my age. Where are his parents? I'd like to know myself who Ewan's father is, the old man grinned. Even my daughter Maggie was herself confused when he was born, and besides, she has been missing for about three months now. I haven't heard from her. Morris expressed surprise. Didn't you alert anyone? What if something has happened to your daughter? The man dismissed Morris's concern. This isn't the first time. Maggie was unpredictable from the age of fifteen. She settled down a bit after giving birth to the boy, but then she was off again. She didn't enjoy the monotony of caring for a baby, so I ended up with my grandson. He's safer with me. As for Maggie, I've long given up hope for her. Morris raised his eyebrows in surprise. If the child is better off with this clearly alcoholic grandfather, what kind of mother must she be? So there's nothing to worry about for Maggie, the chatty old man continued. If anything had happened, her friends would have already told me. Are you suggesting we sound the alarm? Look for Maggie? Then the child welfare authorities will take Ewan from me and put him in an orphanage if they find out about his mother, and he... He's really attached to me. Yes, and I to him. Morris, however, had very different thoughts. He thought that a child would be better off in an orphanage than in a crumbling house with a drunken grandfather. The children are well fed there. Ewan certainly won't have to worry about food. Grandpa, who is that? Ewan asked, appearing on the porch. He was small, dirty, comical, and his eyes, black as olives, scrutinised the uninvited guest. Morris smiled at the child, so innocent, so vulnerable. 
he realised he couldn't just leave and forget him. He didn't understand what was happening to him, but he suddenly wanted to protect the little boy from all the troubles and misfortunes that had befallen him. "'This is a kind man,' the old man explained. "'He wants to help us.' "'Are you hungry?' Morris asked, trying to make his voice sound as soft as possible. "'No,' Ewan shook his head. "'We have plenty of food at home. I brought fruit. Would you like to eat with us?' Morris immediately went to the nearest store and purchased two bags of food for Ewan and his grandfather. The bags included meat, fruits, sweets, and some plastic toys, which delighted Ewan immensely. Morris reflected a lot on this chance encounter. He was concerned about Ewan's precarious situation, but also acknowledged the grandfather's love for the boy, albeit expressed in his own way. As a result, Morris started visiting Ewan frequently, bringing food, toys and books. He enjoyed spending time with the boy and conversing with the grandfather. Inadvertently, Ewan became more than just a stranger to Morris. Despite the grandfather's drinking habits, he and his friends were peaceful and treated Ewan kindly. No one mistreated the boy. However, it was still not an ideal environment for a child. Ewan's mother remained absent. It seemed as though she had forgotten about her son and father. When Morris asked about her, the grandfather dismissed it, saying, If she doesn't show up, then everything is fine with me. She'll come back when she's in trouble, as she has many times before. Morris attempted to get Ewan's grandfather hospitalised. Despite the man's advanced age, he hoped treatment might help him stop drinking and take better care of his grandson. Miracles do happen, don't they? But not in this instance. The grandfather adamantly refused treatment, insisting he was well. Why should I? I have a house, food in the fridge. Not everyone is well off. Don't make a tragedy out of nothing. You're helping a boy from a poor family and we're grateful, but mind your own business. The old man was in denial about his problematic lifestyle, considering it a norm. Many people live like this, he used to say. Regardless, Morris continued to visit Ewan, providing groceries for the family. He left his phone number to the old man in case of emergencies. And then, one day, Morris received an unexpected midweek call. He instantly knew something was wrong. "'We're in trouble,' Ewan's grandfather said. "'They're taking the boy away from me.' Morris rushed to a familiar house, consumed with worry about Ewan. What if something had happened to the boy? The old man's explanation about where they were taking the boy was vague. Could it be the hospital? However, Ewan was fine. He sat on his grandfather's lap, crying, and looked fearfully at the two women in uniforms. Upon seeing Morris, Ewan cried again, this time seemingly out of relief. His dark eyes held so much hope for his kind man. See, I told you, the grandfather soothed as he stroked Ewan's head. I told you that Morris would come and everything will be okay. What's going on? Morris asked the officials. We're trying to place the child into a children's institution, one of the women explained. And this man, who claims to be the boy's grandfather, is refusing to hand him over, causing the boy distress. The second woman chimed in. The boy is now scared of us. He is clinging to his grandfather and won't come to us at all. Maggie is dead, the old man in the corner explained, tears welling up in his eyes. He tried to suppress them. She died in a fire. Now Ewan is supposed to go to the orphanage because, according to the documents, I'm not his legal guardian. But I refuse to let him go. They can't take him away from his own grandfather. Can't we leave things as they are, at least for now? Morris asked. The fact is, the mother was not involved in the child's life. The boy didn't know her, and he was raised in his grandfather's house. As far as Ewan is concerned, nothing will change. He will continue to live as he has. I'll look after him. I promise to be there every day. We have warrants. The woman shook her head. We have to take him away. His grandfather can try to get custody, but honestly, I don't think he'll succeed. What if I try getting custody? Morris asked, 
before he had time to fully consider the idea. Only after uttering the phrase did the man realise that he was genuinely ready for this. He was excited about the idea of becoming Ewan's father, loving, attentive and caring. "'I do not mind,' reassured Ewan's grandfather, hugging his grandson. "'Ewan will be fine with Morris. They love each other. Just don't send him to an orphanage.' You? the woman responded in surprise. Of course you can. We'll arrange a temporary guardianship for you, but it won't last long. If you want to permanently take him in, you'll have to attend the foster parents' school, gather many certificates and obtain your spouse's consent. I'm not married. Well, then adoption is out of the question. The child needs a complete family. OK, let's proceed with temporary guardianship, and we'll figure things out later. We can do that, but the child has to live somewhere else, not here. This isn't the right environment for a boy. Morris, leveraging all his connections, quickly obtained temporary custody of Ewan and moved him in with him. Ewan was awestruck when he saw the clean, spacious apartment. He had never been in such a place. Naturally, he loved it very much. However, Morris needed a nanny for Ewan. He worked a lot and couldn't devote all his time to the child. That's when Morris remembered Cassie. Kelly's friend was kind, sensitive and understanding. She once helped Morris regain his footing in life, and they have remained in touch, occasionally interacting on social media and exchanging holiday greetings. Morris knew that Cassie had recently divorced her husband and left having their five-year-old daughter in her arms. Due to frequent sick leaves, Cassie had lost her job and was struggling to get by. Morris had previously suggested that she join his company, but Cassie declined as she needed to look after her sickly daughter, who couldn't attend daycare. However, now Morris came up with a new offer. Cassie could become Ewan's nanny. He would offer her a good salary, and she could still take care of her daughter. It was a win-win situation. Cassie would have income and employment, her daughter would have her mother around, and Ewan would be looked after. Plus, the children could enjoy each other's company. Cassie readily accepted this offer. Now she came every morning with her daughter to Morris's home, allowing him to leave for work with peace of mind, knowing Ewan was in good hands. It was a time of incredible coziness and peace. Morris now enjoyed coming home to the sight of a smiling Cassie and cheerful children. Delicious aromas wafted from the kitchen, and children's drawings dotted his desk. The house was clean, comfortable and warm. The four of them usually had dinner together, sharing laughter and the day's news. Morris always made sure to include Ewan's grandfather in his life, visiting him every weekend with Ewan. The old man was thrilled for his grandson, and expressed heartfelt gratitude to Morris. "'Lucky you, grandson,' he would say, tousling Ewan's hair. "'I don't know what we did to deserve such a man in our lives.' Several months later, Morris received a call from the guardianship office. They reminded him that Ewan would soon have to return to the orphanage, as the temporary guardianship was ending. The thought made Morris's heart sink. How could he let the trusting, jovial little boy be confined within state walls. Morris knew he had to find a way to adopt him. While Morris had the means to support Ewan, a child could only be adopted by a full family. This meant Morris needed to get married, even if it was a marriage of convenience for the paperwork. Now the challenge was finding a bride he could trust. The answer came naturally. The perfect candidate was someone who visited Morris's house every day. "'Cassie, we need to have a serious discussion,' he said, and proceeded to explain his predicament. He laid out his reasons for needing the marriage certificate and proposed to her. Cassie listened to Morris attentively, forgetting to breathe at times. Morris, observing her, was certain she would decline. However, she just asked one question. Morris, do you really not remember me at all? Strange question. Morris gazed at Cassie, puzzled. How could I not remember? Of course I remember. Kelly introduced us. 
What are you implying? No, we knew each other before. Cassie sighed. More accurately, I knew you. You barely noticed me. I followed you around at the college, tried to make your acquaintance, was infatuated, and you, it seemed to me, were constantly involved with other girls, oblivious to my feelings. I then realised you never noticed me. So it... it was me? Morris couldn't believe his ears. Kelly mentioned you had a previous unrequited love, but didn't that guy move to the capital? Well, that's the story I told my friends when I decided to move on. They didn't know who he was. I mentioned you a few times, but never introduced you. Wow, was all Morris could mutter. This is so strange and unexpected. And now, after all these years, you suddenly propose to me, Cassie smiled. This is the irony of fate. Did you really love me that much? How could I not see anything? I did. I've never felt that way about anyone since. It's for the best. My feelings were too strong, even destructive. But then, then I was able to forget you, fall out of love with you, grow up and realise you were selfish and immature, incapable of responsible, courageous actions. You're right about that. It's all me. No, not you. Not you any more. That man is gone. The man in front of me now is kind, brave, considerate, mature and reliable. This man could not ignore the misfortune of a small child. This man solves problems. He doesn't run away from them. And what? Are you falling in love with me again? Morris joked. He still couldn't recover from Cassie's sudden confession. Quite possibly, the woman smiled. Why not? They were on a deserted shore, covered with soft white sand. Turquoise, calm waves of the ocean lapping nearby, a red sun rapidly sinking beyond the horizon. Seagulls soared in the distance over the sparkling water surface in the rays of the setting sun. A family lounged on the shore. A tanned man in blue bathing shorts played soccer with two children. A boy with sharp black eyes and a charming girl. Their laughter and shouts added to the merry clamour. The mother watched her joyful family from a comfortable chaise long, a smile on her face. In her hands she held a tropical cocktail, and a wide-brimmed hat sat on her head. She appeared rested and serene. The head of the family finally took a vacation. So the four of them went to the ocean coast, the woman rose from her seat and slowly approached the beach soccer players who kicked up clouds of sand. Morris, kids, it's time for dinner, she called. And we should head to bed early. Remember we have an excursion at eight in the morning tomorrow. Of course, the man responded, coming closer. He wrapped his arm around her waist and kissed her gently. Did you hear that, children? We must listen to Mummy. But we want to play more the children protested. Well, we can still play. We'll stage a shipwreck in the bathtub and then compete to see who can fall asleep the fastest. Yay! The children clapped their hands in excitement. You're a wonderful father, Cassie smiled at her husband. And the best husband in the world. I'm so fortunate to have you. Morris hugged his wife again, picked up their children his daughter on one arm and his son on the other. Together, they headed back towards the hotel.